Hello again, everyone. Welcome back to our webinars. Uh, today we'll be doing a webinar on uh, iMachining 3D together with simultaneous five axis um, machining, together also with HSR and HSM. And uh, I can think of no one better to give this webinar than uh, Ahmad Onkar, who's our uh, product manager for HSR, HSM, and our multi-axis package in SolidCam. So, Amod, why don't we just, uh, go ahead, I'll make you the presenter, and uh, you can start the uh, webinar. One moment, Amod. Okay, Amod, go ahead. Amor, I think you're still muted. Okay, one moment, please. Okay, Amod, we don't hear you. You're muted. Okay, hold on a moment. I'll be in touch with Amod directly. I think now we can hear me. Yes, now we hear you very well. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, welcome everyone for this uh, webinar. Uh, today we are going to have a look at a portion of an aeroframe. What we have done is I have uh, created a part which looks like uh, one of the aeroframes. And we are going to have a look at how we machine this effectively using uh, the technologies inside SolidCam, that's uh, HSR, HSM for simple roughing, eye machining for high performance uh, milling. And uh, then we are going to look at some uh, uh, finishing strategies, semi-finishing and finishing strategies using uh, swarfing, the swarfing engine of uh, SolidCam, the simultaneous 5x swarfing, and also the generic 5-axis engine that we have for finishing and super finishing certain areas. Now, as you can see in uh, this particular part, okay, I've done some bit of work so that the webinar is uh, done quickly uh, because otherwise we'll spend a lot of time uh, in performing these activities. So I'll, I'll let you know immediately what all I've done. First of all, all the ribs I have marked in a specific color so that it becomes very easy for me to select these areas. The ribs, are the width of the ribs or the thickness of the ribs basically vary from two millimeters to three millimeters. That's the thickness of this uh, part. And also I have marked certain areas. Now you can see that there are certain areas that have been marked in almost a uh, brownish color. Now, this particular mark has been done, basically, if I go to uh, the draft angle analysis, and if I pick surface at the bottom, all the surfaces which are having negative draft have just created a different color, okay? So all these areas, the internal pocket areas, not the external ones, but the internal pocket areas, I have created uh, a different color. So you can see that those colors are different. Now this is just to identify them, okay? Right. What we have also done in this uh, design is we have designed our holding lugs. 
Now these are pieces of the same uh, material that will be used to hold down the part. So this becomes an integral part of, of this particular frame till the time there, where we finish this frame completely, including we finish the internal walls, the floor, and we also finish the outer area using swarfing. And then we clamp an area in between using soft clamps and we just cut off this lugs, or the holding lugs using another swarfing uh, toolpath, uh, a localized swarfing toolpath. So all in all, it's going to have a few toolpaths for HSR, a couple of toolpaths for eye machining 3D for uh, the material removal. Then we are going to do some swarfing. Now, one of the most critical things that come up when you're trying to machine an al aluminum part, which is pretty large, is warping. We can't completely avoid warping, but we can reduce warping greatly by doing a couple of things. First of all, we can reduce warping by uh, having less stress induced into the part while machining. Now, this can be done by a couple of things. First of all, you induce less force into the uh, cut or you induce a constant force into the cut in, uh, in the roughing. And this is generally done by eye machining where it induces a constant cutting force into the part when it's doing the roughing. But this itself is not enough. What is needed basically here is is also another technique which is widely used in aerospace uh, uh, industry and this is that when you have many pockets to cut, for example you have pocket 1, pocket 2, pocket 3, pocket 4, 5, 6, 7 and 8, the general uh, sense that flows into the programming is that we cut the first pocket, we leave the second pocket, we go to the third pocket, we leave the or we cut the fourth, uh, cut the third, leave the fourth, cut the fifth, leave the sixth, cut the seventh, leave the eighth. So first, we don't machine all the pockets in one go, but we leave uh, some stock or we leave solid stock in between by skipping a, a pocket. And then, after that, we move to the other pocket for cutting. This. This, uh, this particular method generally uh, reduces the stress induced into the part, thereby controls the warping. Of course, like I said, there are few reasons why warping happens, and majority of the time the warping is pinpointed to the stress that is induced during cutting. Of course, your warping also goes, uh, uh, it's, it's also linked to how good you're holding the part how good your tool is uh, inside is held inside the holder. So a lot of things are there, but majority it's basically the stress that is getting induced into the part during cutting. This is what actually causes uh, warping. So we're going to see how with eye machining uh, we can be a bit smart and we can have this uh, what we call the alternate style of machining. Okay, so let's start. So to start new milling, yep, save, right, okay, let's switch off our sketches. I'm going to select Homelay C30 because we're going to do a 5-axis uh, cutting on this part and quartet system, I'm going to pick a plane of face. Okay, that's the plane of face that we have picked up, and that's the coordinate system. That's good enough for us. Okay, I'm just going to accept. Before that, let's also define our material database. We are going to use a aluminium 6061. That's the aerospace grade aluminium. And our machine definition, which is a Hamlet C30, we already have set this. 
if you want to look at the parameters that we have set for the Hyundai C30, it's got an 18,000 RPM spindle, a maximum speed rate of 15,000, spindle power of about 23 kilowatt, and efficiency of about 95% because it's a direct spindle. And the aluminum 6061 has a UTS value of 450 megapascals. Okay. Let's come out of this. We've already selected. Let's accept. I'm not going to define the stock uh, and the part because I want to do it in a different way. The stock already has been brought inside the same part using or it has been done like a block and it already has the holes to hold it onto the fixture. There's a holding fixture plate, so that's the holding fixture plate onto which my stock will be mounted directly. So stock define. This is going to be a 3D model. Take that. Okay. Accept. That's done. So I'm going to switch off my stock now. I don't need to see it. Next is the target. Target is my part. Okay. And I would like to provide a machine setup with a fixture and that fixture is uh, this particular solid. That's the holding fixture and I'd like, like to move the entire assembly of all these three items, the stock part and the fixture by about 125 mm so that it rests exactly on the face of the uh, table. How do I check that? Okay, let's do some. So this is my front view. I go into the machine preview and I have the whole assembly that I can see here. Okay. So I have moved that. I have the stock and the part. I can come out of this. Click OK. I'm now ready for starting my machining. Right. Now, before we begin machining of this part, when, when I started uh, machining uh, aer aerospace parts, we never used to understand, or rather understood why the ribs used to fail. So we used to machine it like we used to machine a die mold part. Just take the part, put the cutter, and let it run into the uh, part for roughing. And then we used to realize that when the cutter used to come up for machining the ribs, the ribs used to start vibrating because they were very thin. And when you have a large cutter running on the ribs, they start vibrating. And sometimes they can just tear off. Or rather, most of the times, they just used to tear off. So we never understood unless, till I met a very old gentleman. And uh, I learned from him how to uh, machine parts when you have ribs. So. What we're going to do is we're going to do slightly the other way around. We're going to do the roughing and finishing of the ribs even before we start machining the pockets. So for us, it's very important that we have the ribs ready before we do the uh, roughing or finishing of the uh, part. So I'm going to add uh, operation from a template. I've already saved some operations for templates so that it becomes faster and easier that we can concentrate on the more, uh, more, more interesting part. So I'm going to add the first uh, HSR. Okay. That's for roughing. Right. Okay. The tool is already selected. It's a 12 ball nose that I'm using for roughing because these are very thin areas. I don't want to use a pull nose and increase the area for my machining. The boundary in this case is going to be by selected faces. So I'm going to make the boundaries based on the faces. Let me define the uh, faces. Now you understand why I colored them in one color. So it becomes very easy for me to pick that color from the model and find all the faces. So it has discovered about 38 faces on the entire part having the same color. So I'm going to accept it. Okay. 
Right, that's calculated. And we will give the offset of two millimeters to this boundary so that I slightly increase the area that I don't just machine the ribs, but I also machine a little bit portion of the uh, pocket that, that would be there. So just I've moved it by two millimeters. Passes, I'm going to keep an offset of 0.5, tolerance of uh, 0.1 millimeters, and my Z bottom is going to be up to here. That's 11.5 millimeter. Okay. Right. We don't need to do anything else because everything else has been already saved into the template. So I'm going to save the toolpath and calculate. This should take a few seconds to calculate because it's a very pretty simple toolpath. So that's the toolpath. And now if I run the simulation, solid verify. Okay, the stock and the uh, fixture. So we're just going to do the ribs. So it'll look very funny because it's just the ribs that we are machining. So we have roughed out the ribs. Now I'm going to finish the ribs because I don't want to touch the ribs once I have opened the pocket because if I touch the ribs once the pockets have been opened out then it can be catastrophic because it will not have any support and there's every chance that it will start vibrating. Okay, so we're not going to touch the ribs once everything has been done. So I'm going to add another operation from the template and this is for finishing. Okay, this is constant step over and I'm going to use uh, the boundary that was created for my earlier toolpath, the same boundary. Okay. Passes 0 0.5, 0 0.5. Okay, let's save it and calculate. Should not take more than 15 20 seconds to calculate the stool path. And once the stool path has been done, we are now uh, will be going ahead with roughing. Okay. Right. So finishing also has been performed. So our ribs are now ready. We are not going to touch them any further. Right. What we are going to do now is basically start the roughing of these pockets. Like I explained before, we are going to have uh, an alternate style of roughing where we will say that we will machine alternate pockets first and then we will machine the uh, remaining areas. So I made a split just to make it look better so that I can have groups of toolpath. Okay, again I'm going to add uh, from a template. I'm machining 3D. Okay, we're using a, a pretty aggressive level here. We're using a level six out here. And the tool that we're go going to use is a 16 R3 pull nose tool. It's going down to this level that's minus 47. So the height is about 47 millimeters, roughly two inches, slightly less than two inches. Okay, the only thing now that I need to do is I need to ensure that I machining does the machining of alternate pockets, okay? Now to do that, I've already created my cutting area or my boundaries. So I'm going to use these boundaries. Out of eight, I'm machining only four. So I'm going to use the four boundaries. So I will define, this will take some time. Okay, so let's define a new boundary. Okay. These so are not the perfect conditions. Okay. Right. To come to the end of the first one. Okay. The first one is done. 
go to the second chain. Okay, there are too many small areas that I need to close up. Yes, please. Go to the third one. Okay. Small things. Okay. Let's get back here. Okay. That is done. Last one now. The fourth pocket. Okay, this is pretty quick. Okay. So we have done four chains. Wanna accept that. Okay, target, okay, the tool is selected, our technology wizard is set at, or the aggression is set at level 6, and we're going to keep an offset of about 0.8 millimeters, that is the uh, stop that we're going to leave is about 0.8 millimeter, and uh, tool path tolerance is about 0.1 because it's roughing. Another uh, thing that we need to take into account is the link. Generally, when you use automatic uh, uh, links in iMachine link, the values are set, uh, they're set slightly less. We, I always advise you to set about uh, half the diameter or the radius of the tool as the arc size. Makes sense. All right, let's save this. I'll add another operation from template. Okay, I'm machining 3D2, okay, again, no geometry, so I'll select target. There's no working area because what I've done now is I've machined four pockets and now the remaining things will be taken care of by the stock calculation and I'm machining will perform the operations on the stock. So we're not going to do any uh, uh, boundary definition for this particular toolpath because it's just machining the remaining area and you can see that it's going to go down all the way to the bottom most point that's minus 50 millimeter okay so this is done let's go to technology it's level 6 everything is same let's save it and exit okay let's switch off our sketches now what I'm going to do is, after we have done the two eye machining toolpaths, I also want to do some corner reduction and uh, because we have used a pretty large scallop and we have got pretty, pretty much positive surface here, so we'll have large steps remaining. So I'm going to remove them with a rest roughing with a smaller tool. So I'll add another operations from the template. And this time it's uh, HSR2. Okay, and we're using a 12 corner radius 3 tool here, and it's for the complete part. Okay, so I've just created a template so that it becomes much easier for us to define the operations and go ahead. Okay, let me save this. Now what I'm going to do is, since these operations take about a couple of minutes to calculate, I would like to put these calculations in the background so that we now go ahead with our swarfing toolpaths, okay? Right, so I'm gonna select all of these three toolpaths and I will calculate it in parallel, okay, on the lo local computer. Oops, sorry, they have a problem. Let me 
do have a small issue here. Let's start again. Okay. Now, Amod, I understand you're working in uh, the development version of 2016. Is that correct? That's right. That's right. Okay. So let's open the part again. Okay. Let's hide the catches. See it and let's check. Hopefully, we are lucky. Let's put the first two tool parts itself into parallel. Okay, that's good. They're running in the background. So let's uh, let's take a look at our swarfing tool parts. Now, if you look at uh, the eye machining or three-axis roughing. What they basically would do is, because these are all undercut, you're going to have a straight wall remaining out here. So you'll have a lot of material left out. And unfortunately, you will not be able to do uh, swarfing in one go, because it's going to encounter tremendous amount of material when it comes to this area. Whereas for positive, you'll not have any issues. But when it's the negative area, there will be a lot, a lot of material. So it can't be removed out in one go. So what we will do now is we will target only those areas where we have uh, a lot of material remaining. So basically the uh, colored surface. Okay. Let's take one of these pockets. Right. Now let's add uh, the swarf machining. Okay. I'm going to pick the geometry, swarfing surface. Okay, it's a bit slow because there are few processes running in the background. Okay. So we have one, two, three, four, five. These are all my swarfing surfaces. But I'm actually not going to machine all of them. I'm just going to machine the uh, simple one or the uh, marked the color one okay so let's give a name to this swarf main one okay and then we have the floor let's select the floor surfaces swarfing is actually a very easy uh, tool path the uh, engine and very powerful. It has got its own major advantages when it comes to toolpath calculation. Very few clicks needed to generate a toolpath. Okay, so I'm going to keep an offset of 0.5 millimeter on the wall for final finishing and 0.3 on the floor for final finishing. I will pick a tool. In this case, uh, the 12 bull nose. Okay. We're going to use this tool, or I can also import tools from a library. I've already saved that, so let's check what tool do we have here. Or do we really need the tool, or we can always get the tool from uh, the existing process. Okay. Let's get this particular tool. This is uh, tool that 12 bull knows. Okay. This is a tool. Uh, sorry. Did port. Okay, let's define a new tool. 
let's have 12, corner radius 3, arbor is 11.5, 55 millimeter out of folder, 35 cut length, 3 flutes, it's aluminium, and the holder, we always use in the existing holder in this case. Okay, let's select it. Right, let's go to levels. Let's change some values out here. Go to the toolpath, parameters. I'm not going to do anything else except just say this is surface normal. Okay, a link, we're going to use a lead in and a lead out. Now once we calculate the first toolpath, I'm going to show you how we trim out the toolpath to those surfaces, close to those surfaces. So for that, I need to first get the first major toolpath. So I'm going to dig out the uh, toolpath. Okay, let's save. And I would like to calculate this toolpath. Okay, so we have a toolpath. We already can see the first eye machining toolpath has been calculated. The second one is running. So I'll leave that. Let them go ahead. You can see that I have got a complete toolpath, okay, which I don't want. Uh, I actually just want this toolpath, okay. I want the toolpath. I want the toolpath to encompass only these surfaces. So let me again edit. I'm going to change the geometry here. So we'll re-edit, unselect all, and we'll just select one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. So we, this is the only geometry. I'm not going to select the uh, corner fillet and just run the calculation again. Okay, that's done. So we have a start and we have an end. Okay, no problem. Let's edit this toolpath. Now because, if you remember, I have marked the surfaces and the toolpath is starting from here. This is, this is going to do a lot of air cut. So I want the toolpath to start close to this and end close to this here. A slight overlap is good enough. So what we have in our toolpath parameters, we have an extension. Extension is generally to extend a toolpath. But you have brought another trick inside that if you put a negative value, okay? So let's say I put a negative value of minus uh, 50 and extension at the end minus 175. Let's calculate. Okay. That's done. Okay, so the start was here. That was the end. So the values exactly will be reversed. So this is minus 175 and extension is minus 50. So let's calculate. Yeah. Although we selected a lot of surfaces, you can see that it's starting and ending precisely where I want. Maybe the uh, minus 175 I can still increase. I can make it minus 200, and maybe this is minus 60. Calculate, yes. Right, so it's starting precisely close to that surface, and it's ending precisely close to that surface. However, if you look at the tool, okay, if you look at the tool, uh, the tool has a cutting length of about 35 millimeters, whereas if you look at the uh, height of this particular wall out here, this would be about roughly 43 millimeters. So in one pass, this obviously cannot be finished or done out. So what we need is we need two passes. So I'm going to use two passes here and calculate. Right. So what we have now here, we have two passes starting and ending at each other. But if you notice, we have not got 
our lead in and lead out. That's because we have just used one lead in and one lead out in the main link area. We have to use, when you're connecting between this license, we have to use another lead in and lead out. So we'll use another lead in and lead out. Calculate. Okay. So that's nice. You can see pretty nice toolpath. Okay. Let's put this also in parallel. Okay. Right. What we have now is we have two passes starting and ending exactly where I want. However, like I said, we, are going to, we have a lot of material remaining because it's an undercut and the roughing would have made it just straight. So we need to do few passes into the wall in a radial fashion. So while I will edit this tool path. And in roughing, I will provide number of layers 5. And the layer distance, each time, it should go in by 1.5 millimeters. Now, when I put on the layers, when I switch on the layers, I also need to define my lead in and lead out because layers use a different lead in and lead out. So we switch on the lead in and lead out and run the calculation. Okay, that's done. You can see that it's done precisely five passes at one and a half millimeter each. So what the tool is now going to do is it's going to gradually shave the material as it enters into the uh, into the walls. So it will remove the excess material. And now what remains to do for us to do is we need to finish this particular area. Right, now to finish this area, also I'm going to need swarf, okay, but slightly different. So I will add another swarfing toolpath. In the geometry, I will not select the earlier one because the earlier one did not have a portion of uh, a fillet. So I'm going to select three, four, five. Then we have uh, six, seven, eight. Okay, it's done. Pitch, edit. Just want to be sure that we picked up all the surfaces. Floor, we already have picked up. Okay, that's the, that's the floor, so I'm going to pick this as my floor. The tool that I'm going to use is a ball nose tool, so I will call for the same ball nose tool that was used for roughing. Okay, oh, maybe another tool because it's pretty short, it's just 40 millimeters, so I'm going to make a copy of that. 55. 25 and this will be 11.5. Just relieve the shank. Let's select this tool. Okay. Perfect. So let's provide some lead in and lead out. Okay. And the lead out. Okay. Let's save and calculate. Right. So we do have a tool path, however, you can see the extension and that's because of uh, out here, step one, that's fine. Let's look at the simulation now. Okay. That's it. Right. So, we've done our simulate, uh, 
finishing of the wall, let's look now because we have all the tool parts calculated. We can run the uh, simulation, but now we can actually run it on our machine. Rather than running it inside Solid Verify, I would like to show you the machine simulation. The best part of machine simulation is with, with the cut sim inside, is you can jump between operations very fast. And the updation, the stock updation happens almost instantly. It takes hardly 5, 10 seconds uh, to jump between operations. Even if there are pretty large operations, the uh, stock updation happens pretty quickly. So that's what we're going to see today. And once we have seen the uh, simulation, we will then machine the outer area with the gout check. And also, we'll see quickly one of the lugs being cut out using the same uh, technique that we used for machining uh, swarf, the press trough, where we uh, made the area by defining negative uh, uh, extensions. So we are going to use the same technique. Right. Now, we already have the part, the uh, fixture loaded on it, and we can start looking at the simulation. Okay. It can be pretty quick. Okay, now the best part in machine simulation is apart from looking at the simulation is how quickly we can jump to the next operation. So I want to directly look at my swarfing toolpath. So I click on the swarfing toolpath and the software immediately starts recalculating the updated stock. Now we already have uh, almost six, uh, five toolpaths before this. So it's going to take about 34 seconds to calculate the updated stock of all these five operations that include two HSR, one HSR and one HSM, and two I machining 3D toolpath, and one HSR rest roughing toolpath again. Okay, so it's about 30 to 40 seconds that it takes to update the toolpath. Now imagine that if you would have to see this toolpath run in the simulation, it would have taken probably a minute or two. This is now being completed in about 35 to 40 seconds. OK, that's done. You can see that I have a roughed out part ready for my swarfing uh, simulation. So I can start my swarfing simulation. We're not wasting much time machining the entire area out there, and we've just trimmed out our tool path to precisely cut into those areas where we think there's a lot of material, okay? Because of the undercut, there's a lot of material. So what we're doing is we have used the negative trimming capabilities inside uh, SWARF, and we have tried to obtain the tool within the area that we would like to machine. Okay, so the simulation will keep continuing. We can now look at the other uh, area of our machining. Okay, for example, we used 12 ball nose to cut the wall. We know that there is material remaining here and this particular fillet is not going to be finished. So we would like to finish this fillet using the regular generic 5-axis engine. So what I'm going to do is I will add a generic 5-axis machining. And we will use morph between two boundary curves. Okay, let's select the surfaces. 
I'm just selecting the uh, okay that's done start curve pick because we're using a tangential capability okay just need to select the last edge. That's done. And the end edge curve is the bottommost curve. Okay, that's done. Right, so we're going to start and end at the exact surface edge. The tool here, of course, is going to be a different one. Let's try and import it from our uh, paper ball nodes. Put the selected. Okay, that's done. So we have a taper ball nose. Right. And maximum step over in this case is 0.4 millimeter. Okay, let's save and I'll switch on my sketch because we like to use a different kind of uh, tool axis control. I already have the curve out here. So I want the tool to move through the curve, close this point, and this is the curve, yes please, okay, and in this case it's going to be a spiral, let's save and calculate. Okay, this is done. Let's switch off our sketches, otherwise we're confused. Right, so we have our toolpath. We observe the first problem. The entries are going in through the part. Okay, that can be corrected. Let's look at some other issues. Let's run the simulation so we can see what, what, are, what are the other problems. Let's look what is happening here. Okay, you can see that the tool is cutting into the ribs not good so we need to introduce a couple of things here to fix this which are very easy first of all we'll fix the first issue to fix the first issue it's pretty simple I'll go to levels and I will define a vector along which the toolpath should enter and retract that's the second point so I've got two points Let's save and calculate to see if the first problem has been fixed. It is fixed. I can see that it's completely out now. We don't have any problems. Right. For the second problem, that's the gouge, it's even more simpler. We'll switch on the gouge check. Okay. And let's select the uh, check surfaces. In this case, I can always select the existing uh, faces 2 as my check surface, yes. Now, in our earlier versions, what used to happen was when you select a tilt through curve, there was no way you could tilt the tool further, right? But from a couple of SPs back, that restriction is out and we can now tilt the tool even though it's being passed on or it's been held through a curve. And what I'm going to use is not a lead-like side tilt because this is pretty complex. We've got a nice thing called as an automatic gouge check. So we leave everything to the software and allow the software to do the gouge check the way it thinks is the right way. Okay, and we'd like to keep an offset of the point 0.1. Let's run the calculation. Okay, this is done. Let's look at the simulation now because we had problems with our gouge. You can see that it's tilted, going through the curve, and it's automatically done its gouge check. It's changing itself. It's making sure that it doesn't foul the part 
anymore, so it tilts itself out. And wherever needed, it applies side tilt. Wherever needed, it applies lead lag. And it's done completely automatically. You don't need to define any distance through which it needs to start and end. So it's pretty much simple and yet very powerful. Okay. Using this now, we can finish that fillet. Also, let's save and copy. And we're going to use a parallel to curve function. The drive surface in this case is the bottom surface. We're going to create some parallel curves. And the edge curve, of course, I can pick it from our second one, of course, go to one. Right. And instead of saying start and end, number of cuts, 35, two path parameters, 0.5. And in the gout check, in the gout check, we are going to enable automatic with the same set of surfaces. Okay, let's save and calculate. This is just to create this particular area. So if I now start showing you the simulation of this, it's going straight, but wherever need be, it's already started tilting itself to avoid the, the uh, gouging. So this is called as the automatic tilting option, where I just need to select an option automatic. The software then picks up and it applies tilting wherever needed. It applies lead lag wherever needed. And then it applies sometimes a combination of both, especially in the corners where it needs to change the angle dramatically. It uses the combination, but it makes sure that it starts applying that particular tilt from a point quite before so that there is not much of a change happening when it reaches to that wall. Okay, so this is for machining the floor. We don't machine it completely. We just machine few passes and the remaining we can do it using three axis HSM uh, two path. Okay, now that we have the Inside done, we can concentrate on, on the outside part. So I'm going to apply another swarf. And in the geometry or tool rather, we're going to use uh, 16 bullnose. Okay. And the geometry, we're going to select all the outside surfaces. It doesn't matter how the surfaces are, whether they are broken, whether they are complete or they are not. It doesn't matter to Swarf because it's a pretty smart engine to generate a toolpath. Okay, and this one. We don't need to define a bottom surface because we're just going to clean it up. Okay, toolpath. Surface detect, link, use lead in, use lead out. Okay, let's save and calculate. Okay, so you have the toolpath out here, a complete one toolpath, but we do have a problem, and that problem is because we have got the lugs in between. We don't want to cut the lugs. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch on the gout check and I will relink using the check surfaces. Okay, check surface. One, two, three, four, and four. So I just need to select the lugs and say that these are my check surfaces. Okay. Remain such one, two, two, four, and one, and four. Okay. So 
selected them. Let's say OK. Let's save and calculate. Let's keep a value of one millimeter. OK. Sorry, what happened? Should have been void by retracting. Check surface space of six, sorry. Okay, that's also not right. Let's relink, that's the best one. Strange. Okay, um, I'll just show you the finished part so that you can see what, what's happened. And be before that, let's look at uh, how to cut off a lug. Let's look at how we cut this lug off. So I'm going to add uh, Swarf again. And let's pick the surface tool. I'm going to use is uh, let's use the 12 bull nose. Okay. So pop parameters. <coughs> Surface normal. Okay. And let's generate toolpath. So we have a toolpath out here. Now, what we are going to do is we are going to, like we did with the earlier swarf, uh, what we are going to do is we are going to apply a negative trimming value. Yes, please. Okay. So we have got a much shorter cut. What we'll now do is uh, we're going to use the uh, roughing and generate about five cuts. Okay. So what we now have is two paths that looks that can cut exterior, that can do lock cutoff, and also can do the internal uh, pocket rest rough kind of a tool path, which is uh, a multiple uh, toolpath like this and then we have got the main finishing toolpath that's single pass toolpath to finish up of the, uh, the the complete area so if I would like to show you the uh, complete part let me open the complete part so that's much more clear how it looks like Okay, let's calculate all the stool parts because they were all suspended. And in the meanwhile, if there are questions, I would be uh, more than happy to answer them. Uh, Sydney, could you take the questions, please? Sure. Uh, well, some of the questions I'd answered already uh, by writing them down to the people. There's one question that I left over for you, which was, uh, can we change the start point of the tool? Uh, I believe that was in the... I believe that was when you were doing the uh, five axis uh, swarf inside. Okay. Uh, currently, currently for four five axis swarf, there's no way we can change the start point, but that can be done in another way by uh, by reselecting the surfaces in a way where you want to start. So the point where you want to start should be a first start surface. So that that way the the so the first point comes exactly at the point or middle of that surface where you're selected. So if you've selected one big surface, it'll come exactly in the center of that surface. But there's no way you can shift it further down. It is it is in works, but I cannot promise when it when it will be up 
for uh, for users to use it. But definitely, in the future, you will have a start point option. Okay, uh, that's it. That's all for the questions for now. Uh, just just a minute because I would like to show them the other tool part. No problem. That was the first tool path. We imported this, so we'll switch on and switch off. Yeah. So this was the tool path. Twenty-seven. Let's run the calculation. Okay. You can see this is how it retracts to avoid the check surfaces or the surfaces that are there. So it doesn't cut the lugs. The lugs can be cut off later using the tool path that I sh showed you at the end. So there's retract, a nice, it comes out, it retracts, goes to the next point, continues the swarfing operation. So if you look at how this would look like in simulation, this is how it would run. If you go towards the lug, retract, go to the next. retract, go to the next, and so on. Right, so if there are no more further questions, I would like to thank you for joining this webinar. It was a bit long one, one or five minutes. Uh, if, if you still have questions, uh, that are probably unanswered by me. You can always write to me at amod.homecar at solidcam.com. And uh, we will see you again next time for another set of an interesting webinar in Five Access. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Amod. And I'd like to let everyone know also that this webinar has been recorded. And uh, in the next day or two, it will be on our website. All right. Take care, everyone, and, and uh, have a great day.